My name is Rebecca Wadler, and I am the Conservation Education Associate here at the Isaac Walton League. Our first webinar tonight is entitled Conservation's Future, Why We Must Reconnect Children to Nature. And this presentation will be given by Ken Finch. He is the president of the Green Hearts Institute for Nature in Childhood. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening, and I am going to turn it over to Ken Finch right now. Good evening. This is Ken Finch. Thank you, Rebecca, and thank you to the Isaac Walton League for sponsoring this. I'm pleased to have been able to work with Isaac Walton for a couple of years now, I think, uh, on this crucial issue of how do we get kids back outside. Uh, just by a, a little way of background, I am essentially an environmental educator for about 40 years now, uh, working with a wide range of kids and adults in a wide range of places. And right now I run a small, tiny, nonprofit conservation organization called Green Hearts, as Rebecca mentioned. Tonight we're going to be talking uh, about kids in nature, and we're going to have some guest presenters who look kind of like this. Uh, this is Calvin and Hobbes. Hopefully most of you know them. Uh, as I do this talk, I'm going to be using some cartoons to try to illustrate some of my points and keep things a, a little lively. We'll have a few other funny paper characters besides Calvin and Hobbes, uh, but they will be the stars of the show, so to speak. So to get started, I want you to put your thinking cap on. I want you to ponder this question. What is your favorite memory of outdoor play as a child? It's very specifically worded. What is your favorite memory of outdoor play as a child? Now, if we were all together in an auditorium, I would ask you to think about this and then share it with friends and share it with the group. But in this particular case, we can't really do that. Um, so I'll just mention that over the years of asking this, and I've been asking this for probably close to 15 years now of various audiences, uh, I've heard lots of wonderful answers. Uh, well, just a couple weeks ago, I heard from a, a long-standing friend of mine uh, his story that when he was young, growing up in the suburbs of Cleveland, there was a good-sized creek near his house, and he and Buddy decided they wanted to play hook fin. So they got a large truck tire inner tube and pumped it up, uh, sawed off a section of their backyard picket fence, laid it on the truck inner tube, and floated down the creek. Uh, that's sort of classic kids playing outside. That was his favorite memory. My own favorite memory actually comes from having lived in Southern California as a very young boy with a lemon orchard as my playground. And besides the wonderful fun of climbing, like climbing lemon trees, which are perfect small size for climbing, uh, my buddies and I used to have lemon wars, where we actually would throw lemons at each other, trying not to hit each other, but instead to hit something in front of each other, so it would actually spray lemon juice in our eyes. Uh, that peculiar little memory is actually my favorite memory of outdoor play as a child, and hopefully you all have come up with great memories. Uh, let's take a quick look, with the help from Calvin and Hobbes, though, about sort of how child's play outdoors used to be. Here's just a little explanation, though, we should talk about, I guess. Um, as you thought about these questions, I virtually guarantee that those memories were about outdoor spaces, about wild spaces, and wild to your eyes. You know, they may not look wild to your adult eyes, but wild to your young child eyes. It might just be a vacant lot, or a little leftover patch of wetlands, or maybe the back 40 year farm. Um, for many of us, those are what those great memories were made of. It's actually very rare to hear anybody's favorite memory be of commercial playground equipment or organized sports. It's almost always something along the lines of mucking around in the woods. But sadly, childhood has changed, and it's changed very dramatically. Here's a look at how it used to be. Look, a trick of water running through some dirt. I'd say our afternoon just got booked solid. It used to be just as simple as that, and I bet a lot of you can remember playing very much like that. Unfortunately, nowadays, it's very, very different. And even though that kind of place seems timeless and that it's really happened that way as long as humans have been on the planet, it may not be eternal. It may not last forever. So the way children's play is now is more like this. See, this is called the outdoors. Oh, I've seen this level on my video games. Children's view of reality is a lot different than it was for some of us who are baby boomers or even younger. Children are truly becoming disconnected from that change has been documented in tons of research now, and there's all sorts of statistics out there. The ones I use just as relatively simple ones. Uh, today, American children spend approximately 27 to 30 percent of their total time with electronic media. 
meaning television, computers, video games, iPads, uh, and, and recorded music as well. All told, American children spend about 1% to 2% of their time outdoors. So call it 27% indoor with electronics versus 1% outdoor playing. And if you look at that outdoor play, and break it down into what we call unstructured play, play that the kids make up themselves, some reports have shown that it can be as little as 30 minutes a week now on average. And that unstructured play is important. We'll take a little bit more of a look at it later on. But unstructured play, where kids go out and maybe get together with a buddy and decide, hey, what do you want to do? It's very, very different than play when you go to a soccer league or t-ball or something that, you know, similar that is designed by adults and controlled and scheduled by adults. That kind of unstructured play is actually really, really good for kids. <clears throat> so. Childhood has changed. The change is powerful. It's unprecedented. It's nearly ubiquitous across all of the developed world. And it's happening, happening incredibly rapidly. Really, childhood has changed in the course of about 30 to 35 years, one single generation. And it's a change that is 180 degrees almost from what childhood has always been before. Uh, nobody even really has a, a good hypothesis about what the long-term effects of this are going to be, but we have some pretty good ideas about what's caused it. So let's take a look at what happened to outdoor childhood. It's a whole bunch of things that have come together, sort of a perfect storm. No great evil person behind it. Uh, it's really just an accident that these things have all happened simultaneously, but it's a very powerful accident. First one is urbanization. It's so lovely out here, you wonder why they have it so far from the city. Today, over 80% of Americans live in metropolitan areas, cities and suburbs. In some of those places, green space for kids to play in is relatively rare. But more commonly, the issue is not whether or not there is green space available to those city kids. It's whether or not they have access to it. If there's a great park two blocks away from a city kid's home, but half of that two blocks is taken up with an eight-lane freeway, then the park might as well be 10 miles away. Similarly, if their parents view that park as being in a really dangerous high crime area, they also probably won't have access. So as we've become more urban, kids don't have that easy, ready, right out the back door type of access to wild areas that they used to have. And again, wild in their eyes. Another impact has been parental fears. A quick example of how over the top we've gotten Read all about it. Falling leaves kill six. Parents are afraid of everything nowadays. They're afraid of the heat. They're afraid of the cold. They're afraid of the sun. They're afraid of ticks. They're afraid of coyotes, and on and on and on and on. All of these have some basis in reality, but all of them are blown dramatically out of proportion. The biggest fear, of course, is the fear of crime or the fear of the boogeyman, if you prefer. Um, parents inevitably worry about their children, and so do other caregivers like teachers. So it's natural to think, is my child safe when they're playing off at a park and I can't see them? Nowadays, it seems like we hear all too often about crimes against children. But the reality, the statistical reality, is that crimes against children are actually less common now than they were a generation ago. What most of us don't realize is that, is that because of media, that perception has changed. We live in an age of 24-7 media, and unfortunately, crimes against children make very compelling news. So on the rare occasion that something terrible does happen, we're likely to hear about it over and over and over again. And it would be the very rare parent whose brain would not be hearing those news stories and thinking, my god, that could have been my child. Even if their left brain knows that statistically, their child is in far more danger in other things like their bathtub. But parental fear is a huge issue. Even though it's not well grounded in reality, it's a very strong perception. And for most parents, perception is reality. So we can't ignore it, but we can certainly try to calm it. Another issue is liability concerns, a different kind of fear, if you will. That's the cartoon City Park No, and I won't read all the list, but the little kids saying, yes, they're worried about liability. Are we allowed to speak? Again, we're way over the top on this. Uh, liability cases involving outdoor play are actually less common than most people think. They certainly can happen and always will because people can always sue no matter how ill-founded the lawsuit may be. 
but the liability concerns in the U.S. are way out of line with most other developed countries. Uh, we really push this. We hear about it, and it becomes sort of self-reinforcing, where you know, insurance agents, for instance, start predicting mayhem for outdoor play when there's really no data to support that that would be a problem. So liability concerns mostly need to be calmed down and addressed with actual facts of what is truly dangerous to children and what isn't really dangerous. Uh, for instance, there's a great statistic out there, uh, a, a valid statistic, that every six minutes in the United States, a child is admitted to medical care for an injury caused on stairways. Think about that, stairways. You don't hear anybody starting a campaign to ban houses with two floors or to sue the builders or architects who, who created them. And yet, statistically, that's way more dangerous than climbing trees or playing in the park down the street. We tend to take for granted the common dangers to kids and go over the top on less ones. And liability tends to play off of that and say, oh my goodness, if a child is hurt, then somebody's to blame. And if somebody's to blame, then somebody can be sued. Another impact is overscheduled childhoods. We can illustrate it with this cartoon. When you say, look, we bought you some new educational software, they must hear, we're doing our best to make your lives one humongous school day. In some parts of our country, childhood has become, or parenting really, has become almost a competitive sport, especially in wealthier suburban areas. Uh, it, it's almost like how many things can you enroll your child into? And it's always well intended, of course, and usually framed in, in concerns about the child's future, whether or not he or she can get into Harvard or Yale or choose the school of your choice, or whether or not they will have a healthy, happy, successful childhood. But this is a huge change, this uh, overscheduling, this constant being in school. Most of us remember coming home from school, and then as often as not, you'd go outside to play. Nowadays, kids typically come home from school and go right back into school, although we call it something different. Now we call it Tai Chi lessons or church groups or organized sports or swimming lessons or French lessons or piano lessons, etc., etc. Every one of these is good for ch children individually. The problem is we're piling them on so much that kids are left with very little free time, free time to use their imagination to create their own play to develop their innovative thinking and to develop that creativity, to sort of take leadership for their own time. Kids need that. It's an important phase of childhood development. And by putting them into a constant barrage of adult scheduled, adult designed, adult controlled activities, we're taking away the chance for them to really grow out of their own minds and their own initiative. And then finally, everybody's favorite boogeyman about children in outdoor play is plugged-in play, illustrated here with, Junior, it's time to take your Lipitor. Not now, Mom, I'm playing baseball. Well, for, for a lot of us, that's really not how we remember playing baseball. And notice, of course, that the child is overweight, to say the least. I've given you some statistics already about children's play outdoors uh, versus play indoors. There's no question that electronics are having a big impact. Personally, I'm not rabid uh, against electronics. I think like so many things in childhood and in parenting, uh, it's a matter of, of moderation, of some degree of parental control. I don't think it's realistic to try to keep your kids away from all electronic devices, but it's certainly realistic to set limits and periodically to open the door and use that time-honored parental phrase, go out and play. So all of these things together have had a tremendous impact on childhood as we know it. There's two main areas where these impacts show up. We're going to primarily concentrate on one, but I want to do a quick overview first of one of those areas, one of those domains of impact is child development. Outdoor play, children's unstructured, frequent outdoor play, has been shown by research around the world have very powerful impacts on a child's development. And there's multiple, usually called domains of development. Um, you see five of them here. These are probably the five most common. Intellectual, social, emotional, physical, creative, and spiritual. There's very, very good evidence that unstructured play in a rich outdoor setting is terrific stimulation for all of those. 
the key being that rich outdoor setting. You know, not out in, you know, just sort of a, a bombed over desolate playground that has just a few pieces of equipment and poured in place rubber surfacing, but some form of natural area, again, natural to a child's eyes, that has immense stimulation, all sorts of sensory stimulation going on. The more kids look, the more they find, and the more often they're out there, the more they find, because those natural landscapes change every single day. That type of play, when kids are out exploring, discovering, testing, experimenting, challenging their own abilities, challenging their friends, really supports all of these developmental domains. It's often been said that play is child's work. Play for a child is not wasted time. Play is really how the human animal has evolved over generation after generation and generation to be adapted to our environment, to the world we live in. And the more we study outdoor child play, the more benefits we find in these areas of learning and socialization and emotional health and physical health. And incidentally, it certainly can't be a complete coincidence that we're seeing such an issue with obesity right now at the same time as children's outdoor play has been slipping away. When you just think of the physicality of that outdoor play, that unstructured outdoor play, with kids running and climbing trees and digging holes to China and carrying around logs, et cetera, et cetera, great physical exercise, which for the most part now is being turned into sitting on a couch playing with electronics. So one dimension of the impacts of outdoor play is this child development, but the other one is conservation related, and that's really what we're here to talk about tonight. Stephen Jay Gould, an author, naturalist, who many of you probably know, said it very nicely, we will not fight to save what we do not love. We will not fight to save what we do not love. What this really says is we need to make sure kids are falling in love with nature, we want them to grow up to be adults who fight for it. For about 35 or 40 years now, there's been research going on around the world, multiple countries, multiple demographics, trying to figure out what is it that turns some children into adults who have deep, lasting conservation values, while other children grow up really not giving a care about nature. Turns out that that research has produced remarkably consistent results, even across different countries and different demographic groups. And there's two that stand out. There's a list of 12 to 15 overall influences on conservation values. And for any given kid, any one of those influences could be what lights the spark. But two of them stand out above everything else. The first one, frequent enjoyable experiences in natural settings during childhood. That's researcher speak for what we now call nature play. Frequent, enjoyable experiences in natural settings during childhood. Basically, being outdoors playing a lot. Calvin will give us a look at this. Wow, look at the grass stains on my skin. I say, if your knees aren't green by the end of the day, you ought to seriously re-examine your life. And for a lot of us, that probably looks pretty familiar. So the single most common influence on adult conservation values is frequent nature play. It's a very, very important thing to remember. A close second influence is childhood mentors who introduced and guided nature experiences, essentially adults who took a child by the hand and shared their own love of nature. Most often this is parents, but it certainly can be grandparents or a youth group leader or occasionally a teacher. But again, it's that adult who took a child fishing or hunting or hiking, or camping, or bird watching, who basically introduce nature to a child with a sense of joy and wonder. Here's a quick look at that. Wow, so you can build a whole snowman without reading any instructions, Daddy? Yeah, adult mentors turned out to be very, very important in this research. When you take these two influences together, what they really mean is that the heart comes first, that emotion is the key that it's not about learning ecology, environmental science, et cetera. That's important eventually. But the first step, the foundation to it all, is emotion. It's falling in love with nature. It's coming to think that nature is a part of your life and that you want it to stay that way. And how do children fall in love with nature? Simple, by being in it, by playing in it, day after day after day. You don't fall in love with nature just by watching videos of it. You can learn a lot from videos, 
but you fall in love by being out there. So the bottom line here, kids need nature, nature needs kids. Kids need nature because it stimulates their development so exceptionally well, better than any classroom, better than any commercial playground could ever do. Nature needs kids because we have to make sure the next generation of kids is falling in love with nature and is prepared to take over the conservation work that we've been doing really very well for the last 50 years. But ultimately, our work will not last if future generations don't continue it. One of the frustrating parts about being conservationists is that the work is never over. Every now and then, we'll have a great victory, and it might feel like, like it's over, or at least we have a great breather. But what counts in conservation is not the next 10 or 20 or even 50 years. What counts in conservation is centuries and millennia. You know, things that we've done in the last 50 years aren't necessarily permanent. Laws can be changed. Parks can be closed. Conservation easements can be overturned by courts. And even the best protected natural areas can still be influenced by pollution coming in from outside of their border. Ultimately, the only thing that will continue conservation and protect the environment long term, truly long term, is to make conservation a deeply embedded core value of our society which gets passed along from conservation to conservation, from, pardon me, from generation to generation. So childhood's paradigm has changed. Shouldn't conservation strategies change as well? Seems logical. We know childhood is nothing like it used to be. Certainly kids' experience with nature is part of that change. We need to think through what's happening and what we can do with it. Right now, we're in a situation where nature facts have never been more available to children, but nature connections have never been more rare. If you think about it, 50 years ago, 40 years ago, if there was a limiting factor in children growing up with conservation values, it was probably knowledge. You know, ecology and environmental science is a relatively young field. And, you know, 1962, when Rachel Carson's um, book came out, Silent Spring, we really didn't know that much about ecology yet. Today, it's totally different. Today, literally, the world's knowledge base is at children's fingertips. If they want to learn anything about nature, they can. The key is they have to want to. Forty or 50 years ago, it was reasonable to assume that virtually all kids had the opportunity to play outside and fall in love with the outdoors. Not all kids did. Not all kids ever will. But the opportunity was ubiquitous. Virtually every kid had that chance, whether they were city, suburb, or out in farms. They had the chance to at least find a little patch of woods or wetlands or prairie where they could play. Nowadays, this is flipped. Kids have the knowledge, but they don't have those emotional connections. So we end up in an interesting situation here. John Burroughs, a famous American naturalist from uh, over a century ago now, actually said it very well. Knowledge without love will not stick, but if love comes first, knowledge is sure to follow. What he's really saying there is that there's an important sequence. First, kids fall in love with nature. Then they're prepared to learn about it in a way that that learning will stick. The heart comes first. So, understanding this, the question becomes, where do we go now? A lot of people have been trying to figure that out. A lot of people are wrestling with this question. How can we restore the nature of childhood? For probably about the last oh, eight or ten years now, lots of conservation groups have been putting more and more effort into this question, trying to find ways to get children especially back outdoors. It certainly doesn't exclude adults, but we have to realize that the future lies in the hands of our children. And if they don't care about nature, if it's not an important part of their lives, then our conservation work is going to suffer. So in my organization, Green Hearts, we have three keys that we think will help restore the nature of childhood. I'd like to share those with you briefly and we'll get a little help from our cartoon characters again. First one, provide the right kind of places. But sir, we're not trespassing, we're exploring. The right kind of places for children's nature play are places that adults don't much care about, places that adults don't protect, you know, from digging to China, from building tree houses, from catching frogs or fireflies, from, you know, whacking sticks against trees. The right kind of place 
sometimes called rough ground. It's land that adults don't care about much about, so kids are free to really play. A local rose garden is not a good place for nature play. A vacant lot is great, maybe a wild corner of a suburban yard, maybe the dark corner of a little park down the street, or again, for a child growing up on a farm, the so-called back 40. These are great places for, the, for nature play to grow, places where adults aren't going to tell them they're trespassing. When my own two boys were young and we had just moved into a suburban house in, in Omaha, which had a very normal suburban yard of you know, grass, a few shrubs, and a tree or two, uh, I was excited because there was a creek across the street, a little wooded creek, and I uh, envisioned my boys playing there all the time. And after a while, I realized they weren't, so I tried a little experiment. I dug out a chunk of turf grass in the backyard, about 10 feet on a side, tore out the grass, uh, chewed up the dirt with a pitchfork, added in a little sand to make it easier to, to dig in, and gave both of my boys little shovels, but real shovels, you know, wood and metal, not cheap plastic, and basically told them, this is your area, go to it. Because it dawned on me that my boys had never really had a place to dig, and kids love to dig. They love digging just for the sake of digging, but it gets even better when they find things. So my kids started digging, and for the first several days, they were finding earthworms and grubs and occasional rock, that sort of stuff. These are treasures to young boys. Predictably, after a week or two, that started to become boring. So they thought up the next stage. They started burying things. And mostly they buried their little Hot Wheel cars, and they buried their little green plastic army soldiers. Most of you probably remember those green army soldiers. They actually may be the only part of childhood that hasn't changed in 50 years. You can still buy the exact same soldiers. So they would bury these things, and after a few days, they'd go dig them up and literally come running inside saying, Dad, Dad, look what we found. And of course, I'm thinking, my children are loonies. But the reality is, that's great pretend play in a natural setting. After a couple weeks of that, it moved on to the next stage when one of my boys discovered that the hose would reach the digging pit. And it became a totally different experience, but very definitely immersed, immersed in nature. The point is that the right kind of play doesn't have to be, the right kind of place, pardon me, doesn't have to be anything spectacular. It can literally be a little chunk of the backyard where kids are free to start digging and exploring on their own and finding little bits of nature that's right there under their noses. So the right kind of place is the first necessity. The second one is the right kinds of play. So Calvin and Hobbes will give us an illustration. Why are you digging a hole? I'm looking for buried treasure. Duh, that's why kids always dig holes. What have you found? A few dirty rocks, a weird root, and some disgusting grubs. On your first try, there's treasure everywhere. The right kinds of play understand that there are treasure. There are treasures everywhere. The right kind of play is, uh, I, I referred to it earlier as unstructured. It's sometimes called child-directed or open-ended. Again, it's play that the kids make up as they go. It's not designed by adults. doesn't mean adults can't be supervising if the adults are wise enough to back off and not tell the kids what to do, when to do it, how to do it, but rather for the adults to just sort of be a lifeguard. You know, the adult is there only if something dangerous starts happening. The right kinds of play are unscheduled, and if not unsupervised, then at least very, very lightly supervised. It's play that children make up. It's an important distinction that we need to realize, too, in the right kinds of play. The difference between playing with nature and playing in nature, and for our purposes, for trying to create a bond between children and nature, is a very important distinction. It's not just about going outdoors. Putting your ping pong table in your backyard is not nature play. Throwing a frisbee in the park is not nature play. Playing golf is not nature play. All of these are perfectly good things. All of them have developmental benefits for children and maybe even for adults. But nature play is direct interaction with nature, actually getting your hands on it, getting directly involved with it, making mud pies, climbing trees, catching frogs, playing poo sticks in the stream, raising caterpillars into butterflies. All of these things are what nature play really is. It's not just using nature as kind of a stage setting for other play, but it's actually engaging with nature. It's important to note that when kids do this, it's inevitable that there will be some minor harm done. 
that you know kids will stomp on ants, they will pull wings off of beetles, they will break off branches. None of us want kids to do these things. None of us should encourage kids to do these things. But at the same time, it's important to realize that none of these actions are doing harm on an ecological scale. And the reality is most of us do the same things. If you want to have fun and conversation sometimes with other nature lovers, ask them what illegal or harmful things they did in nature when they were children. Because almost all of us have these stories. Almost all of us are a little embarrassed about it, so it sometimes helps if you tell your story first. And I have a story that's too long on here, but it has to do with hitting a rock with a robin. And I really didn't mean to, but I did. These kind of experiences, I think, actually play a role in children beginning to develop empathy. Very young children really don't understand death at all. And the idea that stepping on a caterpillar on the sidewalk is going to kill it so the caterpillar never moves again is actually a new concept to really young children. And yet at some point, they have to understand that. At some point, children have to understand that we as humans can have impacts on nature, both good and bad. Certainly, we don't want to encourage this type of harmful play, but it's also something not to panic about if you see it. You can discourage it quite quietly, but don't worry that your child is going to grow up to be a mass murderer You know, if you find him or her frying ants with a magnifier. I did that a lot as a kid, and I seem to have survived into a reasonably environmentally conscious adult. So the second key is providing the right kind of play. The third key, the right kind of replay, which is another term for frequency. Uh, let's take a quick look with our friends. Well, let's check my calendar and see what our schedule is for today. Today says do nothing, so does tomorrow, and every day after, all the way through the end of August. I like this itinerary. Let's get right to it. Yeah, that kind of itinerary, that kind of going out and playing day after day after day. One of the seminal researchers on children and nature, a lady named Louise Challa from the University of Colorado, Denver, um, had a, a great study some years back where she basically did some of her own research on influences on adult conservation values, but she merged it with the influence done by several other people around the world. She came out with a great statement. The special places that stood out in memory where people formed a first bond with the natural world were always part of the regular rhythm of life. I think that's a very crucial phrase, the regular rhythm of life. The kind of nature play that's most powerful happens over and over again, not necessarily every day, but probably at least every week. It's very different than taking the family on a great summer vacation to Yellowstone or the Everglades or wherever. Those are terrific experiences and you absolutely should do them. But in terms of forming kids' bond with nature, the most powerful stuff is what happens over and over again, even if it's on a tiny little scale. Stuff that happens in their backyards, in the park down the street, maybe in their schoolyards if they're lucky enough to have a school that isn't just you know, asphalt and turf grass. But to really have an impact, nature play has to happen often. For kids, that frequency requires proximity. It has to be close to where they already are, which usually means home or school. If they have to be loaded into the family SUV or minivan in order to get to a place to play in nature, then it's not likely to happen very often. Families and parents are just simply too busy to do that. It needs to be places that they can reach on foot or on bike or maybe on scooter. The best solution, of course, is have it right outside the back door. For a lot of kids, that's not possible. But we certainly can aim to find ways to put a little tiny patch of semi-wild nature within a block or two of every kid. So a recap, what do we need to provide good nature play? The right kind of places, the right kinds of play, and the right kinds of replay. So in today's world of childhood, new world of childhood, we're in this odd place place of searching for structured ways to recreate unstructured play. It's a little bit of an oxymoron, and it's a fine line. We need structured ways, structured strategies that can be replicated across the country and replicated among very different types of groups, ethnic groups, economic groups, etc. But if they're too structured, they take away some of that unstructured quality that's really so crucial. So we walk this fine line. In trying to do this, a lot of people are coming up with new strategies. These are just a few, and I'm only going to touch on them briefly. 
uh, naturalized yards, play spaces, and schoolyards. Uh, this is what I just referred to, creating places for kids to play in nature that are close by. Family nature clubs and after-school nature clubs, uh, these are essentially play dates in nature you know, where groups, usually volunteers, uh, get together, schedule a day and time to go meet in a local park or other natural area and let their kids play. With the adults, they're providing that gentle supervision I mentioned. Then a lot of places are starting to add more unstructured play to environmental education lessons, to summer camps, to youth group programs, getting away from having a completely scripted uh, type of presentation where you know you have very firm goals and objectives and every five minutes is plotted out to instead adding in some time for kids to just enjoy nature on their own. Doesn't mean you can't teach at all, but it does mean providing some of that time to just muck around. There's also efforts happening in a lot of uh, cities across the country where different groups are banding to get together to create nature play days or play coalitions. Oftentimes, you're seeing this as collaborative efforts of zoos and nature centers and pediatricians and children's hospitals and scouting groups, uh, other types of youth groups, et cetera, et cetera, all coming ar together around this idea of let's get our kids back out playing. Play leaders and play naturalists, uh, this is really a primarily a European model that's just starting to show up in the U.S. These are adults who are actually trained to engage kids in outdoor play not to lead them in the way that a soccer coach would, but rather to model behavior and then turn it over to the kids. For instance, a play naturalist like they use at uh, Five Rivers Metro Parks in Dayton um, may meet families just as they get out of their cars at a park and ask, hey, do you want to go walk up the creek or do you want to crawl through the prairie for a few yards? Encouraging kids and adults to do the kinds of activities that the families may not think are even allowed but really are the kind of activities that historically have started to form those bonds between children and nature. We're also starting to see places relax their rules a little bit in natural areas. Historically, for many, many years now in the U.S., virtually every natural area had the same rules, things like stay on the trail, don't pick or collect anything, don't run, don't throw rocks in the pond, don't climb trees, don't dig holes, et cetera, et cetera. And yet, when you talk to adult conservationists and ask them to be honest, most of us remember doing exactly those things when we were kids, and most of us remember those things as being influential. So we need to think carefully about rules. Are we just putting rules in as sort of a knee-jerk automatic function, or are we really thinking about what's important for the long-term protection of a site and, indeed, of the environment? There certainly are places where nature play is not appropriate. You know, the patch of wild orchids on your property is certainly not a place where you want kids digging the china. But an awful lot of protected land can easily absorb the slight impacts of children's nature play. And in the long run, we're better off with it because those kids will be forming that bond, the initial foundation for conservation values. It's amused me over the years how often I've heard places like nature centers protest that they couldn't possibly let kids play in their woods because of the damage they do. And yet if you look, you see that those same places have built a driveway and a parking lot and a building and probably did more damage to the environment in those efforts than kids will ever do playing in their woods or their meadows. It's really a matter of thinking through what, what are our priorities and are rules essential or do rules perhaps get in the way sometimes. And then one last model, which is still relatively rare but is starting to catch on, nature-based preschools. These are fully licensed child care type of centers where kids will attend two to five days a week for an entire year or at least a school year, but nature-based preschools are sited in green spaces and the kids are outside every day in any kind of weather that isn't actually dangerous. And that outside time gives them unstructured time, time to explore with adults always there, you know, trained, professional, early childhood educators, but the kids have the freedom to explore. It's really almost a perfect model of the three keys I mentioned earlier, the right kind of place, the right kind of play, and the right kind of replay. Nature preschools can embody all of those. So those are a few ideas of what's being done right now. We're going to talk a little bit more about nature play and how we can foster it because a lot of you have properties where you might be able to allow this or encourage other physical sites to allow it. Let's take a quick look at some core principles of nature play.
Two of these we've already talked about, and I won't dwell on any of them. The first one, trust in nature. After a while as adults, we get so used to enrolling our children in all manner of structured activities that we may lose track of just how engaging a little patch of nature can be for children. Children can play for a long, long time in the simplest of environments. For some kids, it might take a little acclimatization, especially city kids who might not have spent that much time in any kind of semi-natural area. But once they get used to it and get past those initial worries or fears, kids can play for a long, long time in a little patch of wild. So we need to trust that nature is, in fact, a fabulous playground. As I mentioned before, we need to remember that the heart comes first, and we need to stress playing with nature, not just in nature. Frequency is crucial. Don't panic about a little damage, as we've discussed. Relax about those rules. Rethink your rules. What is really necessary? Some places with larger natural sites have actually instituted a zoning practice where they will designate a certain piece of their land, usually close to the parking lot or the interpretive facility, as pretty much sacrificial, you know, recognizing that a huge percentage of visitor activity is going to happen on this particular part that's close by and convenient. And essentially saying it's okay for damage to happen there. And then oftentimes creating another zone where things are protected but not absolutely positively religiously, but the rules are a little tighter, maybe more like the typical rules we just talked about. And then perhaps having a third zone where people aren't allowed at all, and that might be that, that patch of endangered orchids or perhaps a den site for an endangered animal. And you know those parts, you don't want people going at all, you don't want any trails steering them direction. So that zoning is a way to address this rules issue. We need to value active and quiet play alike. Oftentimes we think of nature play as that digging and climbing and tree fort building and running, etc. But there's another side to nature play. It's the quiet side. It's kids curling up in a patch of tall grass and watching the clouds go by. Or maybe having a little tiny nest sort of tucked away in some shrubs where they and their best friend can just sit down and have a good heart-to-heart -heart talk. That kind of quiet, contemplative play is equally important as more active nature play. We need to embrace managed risk thoughtfully, understanding that nobody wants children to get hurt, and there are dangers in outdoor play, but there are dangers in all aspects of life. Remember the story about the stairways and a child going to medical care every six minutes. Nature has all sorts of risks, and risk is actually a good developmental goal for childhood. But there's a key distinction between risks and hazards. Hazards are dangers that kids can't see and can't make a judgment about. You know, the dead widowmaker tree hanging over a sandbox, that's a hazard. Child doesn't know they're in danger. They can't make any judgment about should I be here or not. Never want hazards, and hazards should always be watched for and removed or solved. Risks are different. Risks are something where a child can see the challenge, the potential danger, and can make a judgment about it. The classic might be a log lying across a little creek where a child comes up to it and decides whether or not to take the risk of walking across a log. Those type of risks are actually good for children. You know, it helps them develop judgment, helps them develop courage and resiliency, and to learn what they're physically capable of doing. Children need those stimulations, but they need these managed risks, these risks that an adult has looked at and said, you know, that's okay. Yes, there's a little chance of injury, but there's also a good chance of benefit. It's not just about risk. It's really a risk-benefit analysis. Kids need those kind of risks. And finally, I'd encourage all of you to do what I call applying the test of remembered childhoods. Remember the things you used to do. Remember what was fun about it, and try to make sure that our kids today have similar types of opportunities. So let's try to do it right. Nature play, if you go back and think of those three things, right kind of place, right kind of play, right kind of replay, don't just do something like this guy. See what all the fuss is about. Jump in a pile of leaves. One jump, five dollars, three for ten. And the child saying, you know, sometimes I hate living in the city. Nature play is not, just being outside is not automatically good nature play. It takes a little bit more thought than that. Nature play doesn't need to be elaborate 
doesn't need to be expensive or closely supervised. It does need to provide authentic nature experiences, you know, with real living type of nature. It needs to feature natural living communities. It needs to allow some damage and allow managed risk. Core belief, the most powerful nature play requires real nature. Seems simple. But right now, as lots of good organizations are trying to find ways to restore children's bonds with nature, seeing a lot of examples of places that are really just about outdoor play rather than nature play. They're well-intended and generally good for kids. But remember, if you're really trying to form a bond with nature, it's got to have real nature involved in it. So this kind of tree fort is what we're really looking for. And you can't really see it very well, but those two signs there, one of them says, go back, and the other one says, beware, you know, classic type of tree fort. Or this kind, tree built for climbing, and you notice in the distance is actually a wonderful little rope ladder, so kids can go up, along, and back down. Not this kind. There's actually one local company that advertises this as a tree house. Well, it does have developmental benefits for kids. That's a perfectly good, safe thing for children to play on. Uh, and they could have a lot of fun on that, but that is not real nature. It's certainly not a tree house. This kind of log play, you know, picking at logs, tearing off the bark, finding bark beetle tracks or roly polies underneath the bark, not this kind of log play with a sanded, varnished log, which really might as well be a piece of plastic pipe. This kind of stream play, you know, mucking around in a real stream where you might catch minnows or water striders or find insect larvae like caddisflies. Not this kind of stream play, where you really just have a concrete water table with recircling water. Still fun for kids to play with. There's still developmental benefits, but they're not too likely to form much of a bond with nature when there isn't anything really alive in there. It's just recirculating water. It's not that much different than a bathtub. So what does authentic nature play look like? We're going to take a quick look at some pictures. This will sort of get us near the end of our talk. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on any of these, but it'll give you a little better idea of what we're talking about with nature play. Basic nature play, pile of leaves, lying grass. How about exploring a little pond, maybe with your mom? Or playing in a creek again, terrific creek. This is actually an artificial creek, but very nicely done. Notice the water is very, very shallow, so it's safe. And there's nice cobblestone-type cobblestone, uh, cobblestone -type boulders to play with so kids can form dams and little shoots kind of things kids have always liked to do with running water. Simple little tools can help, magnifiers or binoculars or bug boxes. How about just swinging on a sapling, sitting in a hammock with a friend, building a real rough and ready little fort. This obviously had some adult help. Adults put down the big logs, but kids have been adding to it. It's a nice approach. You sort of create the skeleton of a fort and then let kids fill it out. Or a digging pit. If you look real carefully back here, it says, dig to China. How about a mud pit? This is actually a nature center in Nashville that has a little mud pile here and a mud puddle for kids to play in. And the results look kind of like this. How about just smelling the flowers? That, too, is part of nature play, that simple appreciation where awe and wonder begins to be born. A little physical activity. This child is carrying a pretty big tree cookie and probably pretty proud of the weight he's lifting. Climbing on trees, in this case a dead tree, which is still a great place for climbing. Crawling into snow and ice. What do you suppose these two girls are doing? Yeah, they're pretending to be little baby birds in a neat little nest woven out of willow. And willow tends to be very flexible, especially in the springtime, and adults can easily make all sorts of structures out of it. Or growing a little garden is a great way to connect with nature. You know, not only do they get the the sheer magic of watching a little tiny seed grow into a seven-foot-tall corn plant, but they're also learning about caring for other living things. Catching butterflies, classic activity. Getting close-up looks at them after they've just come out of the chrysalises. Or maybe using a bug box for a good look at all sorts of little critters and then hopefully turning them loose. Or sometimes it's just a matter of jumping and running. This child is jumping off maybe about a three-foot-high berm, but to his world, to the small world of children, that's a big, big jump. Remember, it doesn't take that much. So to recap, kids need nature. Nature needs kids. They're both critical. We need to look at both sides of this ledger, if you will. 
We need to get kids back into nature for their own growth and benefits. We need to get kids back into nature so that they will grow up to be conservationists like you and me, the people who really care. So I'm happy to have had a chance to talk with you tonight. Uh, this is a little information about my organization, Green Hearts. Again, very, very happy to be working with Isaac Walton League on this project and on others. They're doing a lot of great work. Um, they are available to you as resources. Here's the information you need for Isaac Walton League. And I thank you for your time and your attention tonight. And I think we may have a few questions we can try to address. Yes, thank you, Ken. Um, very great performance. We, we've had um, a few questions come in, and I'm going to give you a few. The first one is, how do we get our kids away from the electronics and back into nature? Or better yet, how do we get the parents away from the electronics and back to nature? Yeah, when you, when you come right down to it, the parents are still the gatekeepers for their, most of their kids' lives. Um, obviously, teachers have a, a chunk of their lives, but parents control what kids do for the vast bulk of their time. Uh, the real key does lie with parents. As I mentioned before, I am not anti-technology. My own boys had video games, and I let them play with them, but they had limits. And you know, it, basically, we looked for balance. That you know, I insisted that my kids go outside and play. Sometimes I insisted that they go out with me and you know, go out in the canoe or the kayak or just go for a walk. Um, it comes down to parents valuing this type of outdoor play. To value it, they have to understand that it is important that it's not just wasted time, as I mentioned, that this kind of play is excellent for their children, and ultimately it's excellent for the environment by, by forming these future conservationists. But it really does come, out, come down to parents saying, no, there's other things that you need to be doing besides spending all your time on technology. Uh, it sounds simple. I know it's not simple. I'm a parent. Uh, it can result in some, sometimes some real big arguments or foot stomping. Uh, also, I will warn parents that for kids who haven't played much outdoors, it can take some time. Many times I've talked to parents who say, well, I tried this and I kicked my kids out in the backyard and in two minutes they were at the door saying, we're bored, there's nothing to do out here. And the reality is then it's time for the parent to, to sort of suck up and you know get strong because if kids have the option, if you let them back inside, they're going to gravitate right back all those wonderful electronic devices that provide all sorts of instant gratification. Parents have to be willing to insist, no, stay outside, you'll find something to do, because they will. You know, in a matter of minutes, they will start discovering things to do that they never knew were out there. It's nice if they have a rich backyard with lots of different plants or geological features or anything besides just perfectly flat lawn. But even on a flat lawn, there's lots to be found. Give them a shovel and let them go at it. What else we got? Well, this one is very similar to the other one, also asking about parents. I think you addressed it. But how can we convince parents that their kids will enjoy being outdoors when they haven't mm. experienced those things um, when they were growing up? So how, if the parents didn't have those meaningful outdoor experiences, how do you really get to the parents? Yeah, yeah that's, that that's actually a really good point. I, I think for a lot of us who are involved in nature play, uh, it's sort of the, the worrisome scenario is what happens if we have a new generation of young parents, you know, the 20-somethings maybe, who didn't grow up playing outside, who were part of this, you know, change to indoor childhoods. What happens if we have a new generation of parents who don't appreciate outdoor play and who don't have any of these memories of it? Um, that is the worry that it potentially could lead to sort of a downward spiral, if you will, because they'll be less likely to get their kids out playing, and that will probably keep going, perhaps generation after generation. So that's why there's a certain degree of timing urgency to finding ways to restore the bonds with kids in nature because of that scenario. I, I think there's a couple of keys. Um, one is to look for multiple ways to get parents involved outdoors with their children that aren't particularly threatening or worrisome. Uh, for instance, Lots of nature centers and other outdoor groups sponsor parent and child activities, sometimes called mom and me, but they can oftentimes be, you know, dad and dad and you, whatever. But these are things where the child and the parent or another caregiver, grandparent, an uncle, whatever, are outside doing nature things, but with usually some form of instructor along to provide some security. Parents feel a little bit more comfortable oftentimes in that scenario where you know they're not alone. 
Um, I mentioned, I think, uh, family nature clubs. This is something that if you Google it, there might be one in your area. Family nature clubs typically are a bunch of parents who have bonded together around this concept of nature play and invite everybody to join them, usually for free. And you know, they get together. It can be a little bit of social time for the parents, but it's time for the kids to play outside in a safe environment because there's lots of adults there, but they're smart enough not to intercede if it's not essential. You know, if something dangerous is going on, sure, the parent gets involved. Or if the child brings something to them, of course they can get involved. But I, I think that, that role where the parents are there, you've got the support of other parents to help you along, uh, can be really important. Also, I'd encourage um, parents who, who might see the theoretical value of nature play but might not have experienced it themselves, uh, get the grandparents involved. You know, have those parents talk to their parents because virtually guaranteed if you go back one more generation, you will, hear, you will hear lots of great stories about playing outdoors and about how good it was and how much fun it was. Uh, and in fact, getting the grandparent involved directly, you know, asking your grandparent you know, to take little Johnny or little Susie for a walk or for a paddle or a hike or bird watching or helping them start a garden, you know, bringing that older generation into play uh, can help make up for what the younger parents may have missed when they were kids. Okay, great. I had one more question. Um, you talked a lot about um, replay and having nature nearby, but what about um, people that are living in urban areas, in city living, that don't necessarily have a nature area right outside their door, easily accessible. Um, how, what, would, what would your advice be to them and their children? Yeah, it, it certainly can be a challenge in, in some places. You know, as I mentioned before, even if there's green spaces available to real inner city kids, uh, they may be off limits for one reason or another. Um, oftentimes there are some little patches. I mean, literally even a, a courtyard of an apartment building uh, has nature in it, if you look, and can be seen as a pretty safe environment. Uh, and that might involve getting permission to add some plants or a little garden if there isn't already one. Uh, a lot of cities now have a lot of community gardens, including oftentimes in some, some disadvantaged areas where you know the extra food is very, very welcome, but just as much the chance to be out and getting your fingers in the dirt is a great opportunity. Again, it's one where there's a certain degree of, of supervision or adults involved. It's not completely kids on their own. Oftentimes, too, you will have some form of youth group that can facilitate this. You know, if not an Isaac Walton, then maybe it's a boys and girls club, something like that. Um, also, for the parent who, who cares about this, it's important to realize how small a scale can work. You know, literally, a few large pots, you know, the big sort of polyurethane things you can buy now in hardware stores that are, you know, two feet across but, you know, weigh maybe only a pound. You can grow great things in those pots. And you can grow vegetables, you know, little cherry tomatoes that kids might try, or a little blackberry plant maybe that will sprawl around your porch or patio. Uh, maybe even plant a, a milkweed plant, which is virtually guaranteed to attract monarch butterflies because milkweed is the only thing that monarch caterpillars feed on. And that would give kids a chance to watch those monarch caterpillars form chrysalises, sometimes called cocoons, and then emerge as adults. Uh, and it's not too hard to find some milkweed at your local plant nursery. So basically, it's important, I think, for the really, really inner city kids who don't have access to the, to the kind of ideal nature that we would like. It's important for their parents or their other caregivers to realize how small it can be to start, that you know, even a little piece, a pot or two on the back deck, is a great place to start if that's the best you've got uh, and still can make a difference. So that, that would be my answer. It's, it's certainly more challenging, but you know, as I mentioned, 80% of Americans now live in some form of metropolitan area. So even suburban kids don't necessarily have great access to it. And you know, you look in a typical suburban neighborhood where virtually every house has a yard, but most of those yards look more like golf course greens than they do like kind of sort of wild, unruly areas that you really want for nature play. So it's a, a wide problem that can be solved with very, very small steps. Great. 
Thank you so much. So I think that's all the questions we have, and we're sort of at the end of our time. So I want to thank you, Ken, for joining us. This was a great presentation, and I'm sure um, everyone found it very interesting. Um, and Ken will be joining us again on our third webinar, uh, Youth Programs at Work, talking a little bit about uh, some of these topics going a little bit deeper. So thank you very much for joining us, and have a good night. Thank you, everyone. Good night.